For centuries, archaeologists have tried to find the legendary city of Troy, but without success. Troy is famous as the scene of the Trojan War, the fight for the world's most beautiful woman, Helen, and the ruse that won her back, the Trojan horse. It's a story that's been told and retold by poets and actors for thousands of years. But is it real? Did the city of Troy actually exist? A century ago, a pioneer archaeologist claimed he'd found the site of Troy. But while the public was satisfied, the experts were not. They said it was impossible to match the clues in the ground with a story that may only be fantasy. Now, a team of archaeologists has returned to the same site. In a dig that spans the past 15 years, they've made discoveries which are both dramatic and controversial. But at the heart of their work, one question persists. Have they found the lost world of Troy? At first glance, it doesn't look like much. Nestling among remote farmland, a small hill baking in the Mediterranean sun. But this hill is in fact a gateway to the ancient past. This is Hisarlik in northwest Turkey. It stands near the Dardanelles Strait, a few miles from the scene of the World War I Gallipoli campaign. Every year, thousands of tourists come to Hisarlik in the belief that they're visiting one of the most famous sites of antiquity, the city of Troy. But many experts take a different view. They say no one knows if Troy ever existed. And even if it did, there's no proof it stood here. For 15 years, an archaeological team has worked at Hisarlik. Their findings may resolve the issue once and for all. Investigating the site is not easy. It involves uncovering multiple layers of human settlement. These date from 3000 BC, the Early Bronze Age, to late Roman times, around 600 AD. It's a delicate task, excavating layer upon layer of remains. In charge is eminent German archaeologist Manfred Kaufmann. It's a kind of operation what we are doing. Sometimes I would compare it uh, with a heart operation of, or a brain operation. Uh, Troya is a difficult place with all these layers and with all these expectations of, of uh, every scholar in the world. And everybody knows it better and wants to advise. Kaufmann's work at Hisarlik attracts such attention because it relates to one of the oldest and most famous stories in European literature. The story of Troy was first set down over two and a half thousand years ago in a work called The Iliad. Part poem, part song, part drama, The Iliad was originally performed by actors in the theatres of ancient Greece. Credit for writing The Iliad belongs to the Greek poet Homer, but no one is sure whether it was a work of imagination or whether it was based on real historical events. The story goes like this. Troy is ruled by King Priam. Priam has a son called Paris. Paris falls in love with the world's most beautiful woman, a Greek princess named Helen. When the Trojan elders first saw Helen, they softly said to one another, small wonder that Trojans should for such a woman suffer hardships. Marvelously, she is like an immortal goddess to look upon. But Helen is already married. 
Paris abducts her from Greece and takes her home to Troy. The result is war. The conflict rages for 10 long years. With no chance of victory in sight, the Greeks pretend to retreat, leaving a gift at the gates of Troy, an oversized wooden statue of a horse. Inside the horse, a group of warriors sits nervously waiting. What follows is probably the most ingenious and unlikely example of siege breaking ever recorded. The unsuspecting Trojans bring the horse into the city. The soldiers hiding inside creep out and open the city gates. The Greek army pours in. Helen is rescued, but Troy's fate is sealed. The Iliad gives a haunting account of the destruction and massacre that followed. Forthwith, the Greek heroes hewed the Trojans down on every side. Their dying groans rose hideous as a sword smote them. The river ran red with blood. And it seemed as though all Troy was burning utterly in fire. Homer was writing in the 7th century BC, some 500 years after the events he described were supposed to have taken place. That meant the Iliad could be a work of complete fantasy. Whether there was anything like the kind of war that Homer described, with a vast Greek army besieging the city for 10 years for particular reasons under particular leadership, all that must be uh, very speculative. The Homeric myths are a composite of many traditions built up over time. There were many wars and there are other sites like Troy um, in that part of the world. So whether the Iliad is actually true as a series of events or not, I don't think can ever be proven. In the Iliad, Homer described the city in some detail. Its size, its surroundings, its wealth. For centuries, scholars and historians tried to find a place that matched Homer's description, but their efforts came to nothing. Then, in 1871, adventurer and self-proclaimed archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann claimed he had found Troy, here at Hisalak in northwest Turkey. Schliemann first got the idea from this man, British amateur archaeologist Frank Calvert. Critics later claimed that Schliemann stole both Calvert's research and the credit for the find. Archaeologist Donald Easton has spent five seasons at the Hesalik dig and has made a special study of Schliemann's life and work. It's often said um, that Schliemann did enormous damage to this site and in some ways that is true. His initial work was unbelievably crude. I mean, he was uh, winching down great vertical chunks of earth using crowbars and winches and battering rams. At first, Schliemann dug down to the lowest part of the mound. In the process, he carved a massive trench right through the center of the site. It was a typically drastic approach. He drove this enormous north-south trench through the mound, digging it out with the object then of widening out and opening up the whole area so as to be able to expose the city of Priam. But Schliemann could never have imagined what he was about to find. As he dug at various times over the next 20 years, he uncovered not one city, but nine different settlements each built upon the other, dating back more than 5,000 years to 3,000 BC. There has been continuous human occupation here longer than almost anywhere else in the world. Archaeologists still marvel at the prospect. Here we can get a really nice picture of the layer cake that is Troy, because down at the bottom we've got the remains of Troy I from about 3,000 BC. 
You can see there um, the side of Schliemann's north-south trench, which he cut through in the early years. Then up the side here is a gradual build-up um, with a platform laid out in about 2500 BC on which Troy II was built. And there, if you look at those unexcavated pinnacles of earth up there, uh, if you were to dig into those, you would find remains of Troy III and Troy IV. And that's what makes this place such a, such a wonderful, rich site, this, this great accumulation of ruins over such a long time. But the site turned out to be rich in more ways than one. As he finished digging his great trench, Schliemann literally struck gold. Buried in the earliest layer, the layer he believed dated to the time of the Trojan War, Schliemann uncovered a fabulous treasure. He claimed it belonged to the Trojan leader in Homer's story, King Priam. For Schliemann, the treasure proved beyond a shadow of doubt that the Troy of legend really existed and that the site of Hisalik was it. The treasure was put on display in the Berlin Museum. It caused a sensation. Triumphantly, Schliemann even dressed his wife in some of the more spectacular pieces and published her picture in the press. But stylistic analysis by Schliemann's colleagues revealed that the treasure belonged to a much earlier period, the early Bronze Age, a thousand years before the time of Homer's story. The treasure could have had nothing to do with the Troy of legend. It was simply too old. It has nothing really to offer us for the second millennium BC, when the Trojan War should have taken place. It has no connection with King Priam, if King Priam ever lived. It had no, no connection with the Trojan War, if the Trojan War ever happened. By the time of his death in 1890, Schliemann had been forced to admit the collapse of his claim to have found Troy. After Schliemann's death, the treasure went on to have an adventurous career. In 1945, during the last days of World War II, invading Soviet troops poured into the city where the treasure was stored, Berlin. As the Third Reich collapsed, the Soviets took the treasure away for safekeeping. It promptly vanished and stayed vanished for decades. Only 50 years later, as the Soviet Union in its turn was crumbling, did the treasure reappear, hidden in the cellars of Moscow's Pushkin Museum. Once again, the public were able to feast their eyes on a marvel of antiquity. Schliemann's treasure is without doubt a fantastic hoard of early Bronze Age jewelry. Yet it brings us no closer to confirming the existence of Troy. But new findings made by the latest expedition to Hisarlik may change all that. Time is running out for archaeologist Manfred Kaufmann. He's spent 15 years digging at Hisarlik in northwest Turkey, the supposed site of ancient Troy, and this is his final season. Kaufmann is one of the world's leading experts on the archaeology of ancient Turkey and has spent 30 years in the region. He's come to believe, in the face of academic skepticism, that Hisarlik and Troy are one and the same. Kaufmann's operation is called Project Troya. It ranks among the largest, most expensive archaeological digs ever mounted. Each day, dozens of local labourers work the site. Artists meticulously record the exact position of thousands of found objects. Restorers carefully piece them together, while a 70-strong team drill and scan and dig for more. Kaufmann faces the same challenge faced by his 19th century predecessor, 
Heinrich Schliemann. How to solve the riddle of Troy in the face of critical scrutiny. But Kaufmann remains confident. We uh, are in the position of putting the excavation of Schliemann uh, in the right context because we are here and seeing the walls of Schliemann, understanding them better, thinking about them, and uh, having this huge work with a lot of workmen uh, better under control. The Hisalak site consists of nine layers dating back 5,000 years. The excavation centered foremost on layer number six, the 3,000-year-old Late Bronze Age settlement. This had stood at the time the Trojan War was supposed to have taken place. But Layer 6 was nothing like the city described in Homer's epic, the Iliad. That prompted skeptics to claim it was simply not big enough to qualify as Troy. Indeed, the entire site was little bigger than the Tower of London. But Kaufmann, like Schliemann, suspected there was more here than met the eye. The Late Bronze Age attracted us because there were a lot of hints that Troy is much bigger than uh, thought before by Schliemann. He wished it to be bigger. He wanted it to be bigger. At ground level, Kaufmann's team could discern little more than Schliemann had done. So they turned to a relatively new process, magnetic prospecting. By measuring fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field, the prospector detects objects buried deep underground. Its deployment led to a breakthrough, evidence that Hisalak was indeed bigger than previously thought. Like a magnetic radar, the prospector generated images of city streets from both the Bronze Age and Roman times. But the survey also revealed a major structure running around the Bronze Age portion of the town. Excavation uncovered the structure, a massive ditch cut into the bedrock. It was very exciting because everybody thought this might be the fortifications of the late Bronze Age lower town. So you have to imagine a ditch here that would have been about four meters wide and four meters deep. There's a break here where the late Bronze Age occupants had left a causeway through the ditch, but the ditch then continues from there onwards, and it's been traced right around now uh, the south side of the lower city. There's, been, there's evidence for it running up the west side of the lower city now, and also uh, it's likely that it runs up the east side. The ditch turned out to enclose an area many times larger than the original site. Was this the great city that Schliemann had missed? The ditch fill includes rubble from buildings, bits of brick, bits of building stone, bits of pottery too, which indicates that here we had not simply a defensive system and then an open area, but quite close to the ditch, probably buildings. So I think it's pretty clear that between here and the citadel, there was a complete built-up area. It wasn't simply a little citadel the size of the Tower of London. It was a great city. The excavation had revealed a city that now matched Homer's description in one important respect. At the time in question, this place was the right size. So what could this Bronze Age city have been like? Troy is uh, about 13 times larger in extent than known before. So we have a rough idea about how many people lived in this city. Let's say about five to 10,000. Comparison between the excavation here and at other Bronze Age sites reveals how the layer six settlement might have looked. The stone battlements, towers, and multi-story buildings all convey an impression of a remarkably sophisticated city. 3,000 years ago, one of the wonders of the world. If these ruins alone from the fortification would stand in Bulgaria or Romania or Yugoslavia, 
uh, Poland, Germany, you always would say, oh, it is the center of the Balkan, it's the center of Europe. So people coming to this place would be very astonished to see something of high culture, which they never had seen before. To build such a city, the inhabitants would have needed a sophisticated technological basis to their culture. That in itself is a sign of an advanced society. In fact, the stonemasons here were sufficiently skilled to make the city's towers earthquake-proof. Look at this beautifully made masonry, all fitting closely together cut without the use of iron tools. Look at how this stone is wider at the outside and narrows towards the centre of the tower. The same is done in reverse behind me. And the total effect is that the weight of the stones is pushed towards the centre of the tower, so that if it were shaken by an earth tremor or an earthquake, it wouldn't tend to fall apart. It would tend to collapse into itself and, if anything, get stronger. So the ruins at Hisarlik indicate a city big enough and sophisticated enough to have been Troy. But one thing at Hisarlik did not fit Homer's description, the site's location. In Homer's two and a half thousand year old account of the Trojan War, the Iliad, the city of Troy is described as a wealthy port. But the modern excavation site at Hisarlik in northwest Turkey is over four miles inland from the sea. In an effort to resolve this contradiction, archaeologist Manfred Kaufmann brought in a man with a machine. This is a deep bore drill. It belongs to Turkish geophysicist Ilhan Kayan. Kayan has extracted hundreds of soil samples in an effort to analyze the geological history of the area. This is like a book. Each layer, each lamina, each uh, sheet of sediment gives you what was the place at that period. For instance, when we go down about 20 meters, if we see there marine sediments, this means this place was marine. Surprisingly, Beneath the farmland that surrounds Hisarlik, Kayan has found marine sediments, proof that these fields once stood underwater. Kayan has concluded that 3,000 years ago, during the supposed time of the Trojan War, the coast here would have looked very different. Hisarlik stood much closer to the sea. About half a kilometer, let's say, away from the citadel, the area was covered by uh, sand and silt, and it was land, but it was a swampy land. This means uh, they were closer to the sea at that time. If Kayan is right, the sea reached inland to a giant lagoon. Around the lagoon, a belt of swampy terrain. Hisarlik stood on the edge of this swamp. Access to the sea would have given the site access to trade and wealth, and its reason for being. Then, as now, the Dardanelles Strait was a very busy waterway, the main trading route to the Black Sea, and beyond that to Central Asia. 3,000 years ago, Hisarlik was a wealthy port, and that brings it another step closer to matching Homer's description of Troy. You had its access to the trading networks of the Aegean and perhaps of the Black Sea, enabling Troy to import and export, importing perhaps copper, tin, maybe gold, maybe silver, exporting perhaps things we can't see in the archaeological record, such as textiles, maybe slaves, we don't know. This is what Bronze Age Troy could have seemed like, a dynamic city, a busy port, filled with visitors and traders drawn from the four corners of the known world. Something not that dissimilar 
to the modern Turkish city of Istanbul. If you were coming out of Europe, it must have been enormously impressive. And arriving here by sea must have been very similar to such a person, to your arrival as an immigrant in the 1930s and getting that first fantastic view of Manhattan. So the Bronze Age remains at Hisarlik seemed to indicate a large city that stood close to the sea. The match with Homer gets better. But it still doesn't prove that Hisarlik is Troy. The excavation continued. Crucial to the archaeological hunt for Troy, of course, was evidence of warfare. In his great work, The Iliad, the ancient poet Homer had described a war before the walls of Troy that lasted 10 years. Only by using the Trojan horse to trick their way into the city had the Greeks finally won. Now, among the ruins of Hisarlik, the Project Troia team began turning up signs of a major war. Firstly, the team uncovered a layer of charcoal, evidence perhaps of a city-wide fire. Does this match Homer's description of the burning of Troy? Radiocarbon dating of the charcoal places the fire at about 1250 BC, the time believed to mark the end of Homer's Trojan War. Next, the team began finding lodged in the city walls the well-preserved remains of bronze spear and arrowheads. In the ground, they uncovered more. Did these spearheads reflect Homer's descriptions of large-scale battles before the walls of Troy? Maybe. And the team found one more proof of war, even more dramatic. Bones, both of horses and of humans. Were these the skeletons of stallions and the graves of their riders? The charcoal, the spearheads, the bodies. Kaufman has no doubt about what he's found. We have a lost war, uh, signs for a lost war. We have people killed, we have weapons, um, and a conflagration uh, all over this area. Here were signs of warfare occurring at about 1250 BC, the right date for the Trojan War. Combined with the newly established size of the city, and its strategic position near the coast, this evidence steered Kaufmann closer and closer to one conclusion, that 3,000 years ago, during the late Bronze Age, the city of Troy had actually existed, as Homer had described. But did this mean the Trojan horse, King Priam and Helen of Troy had really existed too? As an archaeologist, Kaufmann had always said he had not set out to find the scene of the Trojan War, nor to prove that Homer's Troy had actually existed. There was no chance of finding the wooden horse or the remains of Helen or King Priam. We never, as archaeologists, can say there was a Trojan War, uh, there was Helen in Troy, there was Priam in Troy, because we have no proof for that. We have proof for wars, but we do not have the proof for the Trojan War. But years of painstaking archaeology, combined with a high-tech scientific investigation, had thrown up a combination of clues that both the city and the war were real. This meant Troy was a real place, and it stood here at Hisarlik. It seemed an innocent enough claim, but it caused a storm. Critics began to accuse Kaufmann of exaggerating his finds. Their doubts were fueled by the fact that Project Troia had hefty commercial backing. The temptation to please sponsors with dramatic discoveries, said some, must be irresistible. 
Maybe Kaufmann had succumbed and put too much weight on too little evidence. The problem in Troy is, is uh, particularly acute uh, because the, uh, the ruins, such as they are, have been damaged even in antiquity to the point where precisely the parts of the site that we would like to be able to see are just not there anymore. Um, the side of Troy, which uh, Homer seems to refer to when he describes the Greeks attacking Troy, um, was already destroyed in antiquity. Kaufmann hit back. His critics couldn't accept his interpretation, he claimed, because of their own vested interests. People who have learned and who have taught their students uh, in ancient history and so on that all this is invention, are in a difficult situation, or maybe in a difficult situation, and they are looking now uh, to counter arguments uh, to stay to their old established views. But the criticisms didn't let up. If this was the Troy, where were the royal tombs, the burial chambers for King Priam and the others? Where were the remains of the 10 year old Greek army camp? I would like to see the Greek camp excavated and laid out. We know from Homer that the Greeks were there for 10 years. They, we know that they had temporary encampments. More detailed uh, excavations of, of that kind of site will convince me that the site of Hisalic and the Troy of Homer's legends are one and the same. The row rumbled on. It seemed as if Kaufmann was destined to tread the same controversial path as his predecessor, Schliemann, forever trying to convince his colleagues that he'd found Troy. Linking his Saluk to Homer only provoked criticism. After all, the Iliad was a work of fiction. It was written 500 years after the events it described were supposed to have taken place. What was needed was some kind of contemporary reference, Bronze Age writing that could be tested against physical evidence at the site today. For decades, scholars had looked for references to Troy in archaic Greek writings, but they'd found nothing. At Isalik, Archaeologists had drawn even more of a blank. No writing at all. No tablets, no inscriptions. Then, Kaufmann's team made an astonishing discovery. Among the ruins, not of layer six, but of the settlement that followed it, layer seven, built around 1100 BC, a small bronze seal inscribed with two names. This was an exciting find. So far, the only piece of writing discovered at the site. And it was to give help to Kaufmann's cause from an unexpected quarter. The hieroglyphs on the seal belonged to a now obscure language used in Western Turkey during the second millennium BC, Luvian. The Luvians had lived under a people who dominated central Turkey, the Hittites and it seems they shared a language. Lewin is, is closely related to Hittite, um, as close as, say, Italian and French, and both of them are Indo-European languages. That means to say they're related to Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. The Hittites were diligent record keepers. They avidly inscribed on stone tablets the daily routine of government, tax accounts, lists of military equipment, and so on. As an expert in ancient languages, David Hawkins had noticed that one of the Hittite kingdoms, a place called Wilusa, was in northwest Turkey, the same region as Hisalik. Hawkins further noted that the name Wilusa sounded similar to the Greek word for Troy, the word used by Homer. Ilios. Hawkins had therefore come to suspect that both Wilusa and Ilios described the same place, Homer's Troy. His hunch paid off. 
he found a Hittite treaty dating to 1280 BC, just before the time of the Trojan War. In the treaty, he encountered a clue that could be tested against both Homer and features at the archaeological site. That clue was contained in a list of Wilusan gods. Typically of Hittite treaties, uh, they end with a god list. The gods are invoked as witnesses to the treaty. And among the gods of Wilusa, we have a reference to something which is called Divine Earth Road. That is to say, um, it is a way into the earth, a way into the underworld, and we know what these things are geographically. They are where rivers uh, enter, uh, flow into the underground and flow into potholes and so on. So in Bronze Age times, according to the Hittites, Wilusa was built upon an underground stream, one special enough to merit divine status. Under the mound at Hisalak, archaeologists also found an underground stream, a large one fed by rainwater seeping through the limestone rock native to the region. This in itself was not surprising, as most ancient cities were built near sources of fresh water. But the excavation turned up something more. Channels and tunnels in the cave bore signs of construction. Ancient engineers had clearly extended the stream into a massive drainage system. Here was an underground water source worthy of worship. This is the entrance to a network of man-made caves, which stretch at least 100 meters underneath the lower city. And the purpose of all this was to collect water as it filtered through the permeable limestone and to provide a source of water for the inhabitants of the lower city. Significantly, in the Iliad, Homer also referred to sacred springs running out of the side of the hill where Troy stood. But was this cave old enough to have existed during the second millennium BC, supposedly the time of the Trojan War? Dating of limescale deposits on the cave walls gave the answer. The earliest deposits on the face of the cave go right back to the early third millennium BC. That means the period of Troy one, two, or three. These caves, at least in origin, are as old as Troy itself. But what it means is that there was this water producing system here, both in Homer's time and in Hittite times. For the first time, a physical feature at the site linked an independent contemporary Hittite inscription with a reference in Homer. The water system offers the strongest proof yet that Hisalak could indeed be the Troy of legend. For Kaufman, it was a triumph of methodical detective work. But Kaufman's team was faced with one more question, and it was perhaps the most obvious one of all. If Isalak was indeed Troy and was destroyed in the Trojan War, what happened to it next? The excavation had one more secret to uncover, the ultimate fate of the great city of Troy. It seems a world away from the story of ancient Troy. But this place offers a flavor of what Troy became during the later stages of its long history. This is the Anzac Memorial. It stands atop the cliffs of Gallipoli, where during World War I, a quarter of a million soldiers died. But this region was a site of remembrance once before over 2,000 years ago. Six miles from Gallipoli, archaeologists are working on another great site of homage. In the last centuries of the pre-Christian era, 
people came here to pay tribute to the heroes of the legendary Trojan War. This is Hisarlik in northwest Turkey. It's long been reckoned that this was the site of the great city of Troy. Recent investigations by the Project Troya team have revealed the extent of the homage site superimposed upon earlier Trojan settlements. But five centuries after the Trojan War, we have layer eight, a large new city. So why was Troy revived? The answer lies in the incredible power of the legend of the Trojan War and the writings of Homer. The um, Iliad and the Odyssey, once they're written down in the late eighth century, had an enormous impact on the Mediterranean world. We can see this as we look at the pottery with scenes from the Iliad and the Odyssey that appear almost immediately and all over the Eastern Mediterranean. And one of the reasons why these two epics had such prominence is that so many areas trace their uh, descent, their ancestry, from these heroes who had fought in the Trojan War. The home of the Trojan heroes became a holy place a place imbued with enormous mythological and religious significance, a place that everyone wanted to claim a connection with. In their turn, the Persian Emperor Xerxes and the Macedonian warlord Alexander the Great both made the trek to the city. But the most enthusiastic pilgrims came from Rome. The early Roman emperors traced their descent from Troy, and it was, of course, also viewed as Rome's mother city. And so they pumped a great deal of money into the site. Many of the buildings that you see in the marketplace, the Agora, are as grandiose as they are because of imperial benefactions. But the emperors were not alone. Just like modern tourists, thousands of ordinary Greeks and Romans would have ventured here, seeking contact with the warriors and gods of a glorious past. In effect, the Greeks and Romans developed Troy as an historical shrine dedicated to the Trojan War. They called it Ilium. Indeed, among the ruins of Ilium, evidence of the tourist presence in Greek and Roman times is still visible. This is the very northeastern corner of the citadel mound of Troy. Sticking out of it, you can see this great triangular block, which is the remains of the old Late Bronze Age citadel. Um, which would have stood at the time of the Trojan War, if there was a Trojan War. And the, the Hellenistic Greeks have built up against it this staircase. And I think you can just imagine the tourist guides here taking people up these steps, and you could imagine them saying, there now, this is the one bit that still remains of the Troy where our ancestors fought. Just touch that, because here you're touching history. Not much of Ilium survives now. To get an idea of how it might have looked, we have to go further south along the Turkish coast to another city built at about the same time, Ephesus. Ephesus is distinguished by magnificent multi-story public buildings, paved streets, and impressive amphitheaters. Its grandiose architecture still delights visitors, and its scale and appearance allows us to create a picture of what Ilium would have looked like. Behind us here, there would have been the Acropolis with the Temple of Athena on top. You have to imagine this stretching up, oh, 10 or 15 rows of seats here, to uh, pretty well the top of the temple platform so that people could go in and out of the Odeon here at the top. 
But there was a darker side to the Roman obsession with Troy's legendary past, as excavations on the southwestern corner of the Citadel Mound have come to reveal. This area is a pagan sanctuary. Its large size proves the city bore witness to many cult practices. One of them was an offshoot of the popular cult of Athena and was in turn directly linked to the story of the Trojan War, the custom of the Locrian Maidens. The custom of the Locrian Maidens, this goes back to an episode in the Iliad where uh, Ajax, a Greek hero, dragged the Trojan woman Cassandra from the cult statue of Athena, thereby violating Athena in a sense because that was a place of sanctuary. Ajax was by tradition a native of the Greek town of Locris. So every year, in penance, the Locrian rulers sent two young women to Troy. Their job? To keep the temple of Athena clean. And if they were found outside the sanctuary of Athena, according to the ancient descriptions of the custom, they could be killed. After a year, the women were replaced, if they'd survived. This continued until probably the early first century BC. So at least the Ilians had a clean sanctuary for nearly a thousand years and they had it free. For 500 years, Ilium enjoyed a golden age. Bolstered both by trade and by its strategic location, the city continued to grow in size and wealth until it rivaled Ephesus itself. But then, Ilium began to face a new threat. Mud. A slow and remorseless silting up of the harbor that drove trade away and with it the wealth that kept this archaic fairyland alive. And, just as the sea retreat reached crisis point, so Ilium fell from favor among the rich and powerful. For Rome had become Christian. The newly devout Caesars had no interest in preserving a city so closely linked to a freshly discredited pagan past. The emperors in general stopped coming in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, and the primary reason for that is Christianity. The money is being directed to other sites that have some sort of Christian heritage, as this site does not. Its uh, primary associations were pagan. And the benefactions that had always characterized the city during the Roman Empire also uh, tend to stop. Earthquake and disease also hastened the end. By 650 AD, Ilium was all but dead. Today, at the Hisarlik site, the excavation has begun to wind down. The archaeologist who has perhaps done more than any other to reveal the lost worlds that lie beneath this soil, Manfred Kaufmann, will soon face a crossroads in his life's work. I will not move away from Troia, but I'm 60 years old. There always will be excavation in Troya, and my scholars, uh, my students, who I have done so much work and effort in this site, will continue this work. And I would be most pleased to look uh, from that, not in an armchair, but uh, to have helped and support uh, that they, the next generation can continue. Kaufmann's team has come closest of all to understanding the real history of Troy. For the first time, we can say that 3,000 years ago, here was a great city, a strategic hub of seaborne trade, a city that suffered war and destruction, a city that underwent rebirth as a pagan shrine dedicated to the memory of that epic past. The tourists still come to Hisarlik. Their confidence that here stood the Troy of legend can now be justified. History can never confirm if Homer's heroes ever lived, nor whether the legendary Trojan horse ever existed. But thanks to modern archaeology, the city in which Homer placed his heroes, the lost city of Troy, is lost no more. <laughs> <laughs>